Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Saturday study through the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Get your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number three. We're looking today at the last of the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, the church of Laodicea. I think it's kind of interesting or fitting that for the last Saturday of the year, New Year's Eve, we come across this particular letter to the last of the seven churches that are mentioned, letters that are dictated to them from the Lord Jesus Christ through the Apostle John. I'll begin reading at verse number 14 of Revelation chapter number 3. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, this letter is like the others in that following a particular format, it begins addressing the messenger, which we believe to be the shepherd or the pastor of the church. Jesus then gave a description of himself. Remember that when we looked in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, John had been exiled to the Isle of Patmos, and he was given visions, and uh, some people believe that actually was allowed into heaven to see the things there. Whether he was taken there physically or in spirit, we don't know. But he heard a voice speaking to him behind him. And when he turned to see the voice that spoke with him, he gave us a description of the glorified, resurrected Christ. And from that attempt that he made to describe the Christ that he saw came these various descriptions that Jesus used, different ones in each of these seven letters, to describe himself at the beginning of each letter. And here the description is uh, of himself. It's the only place that amen is used as a proper name. He said, these sayings says the amen. And it was referring to Jesus. Then he said he was the faithful and true witness. There was no fake news from either side of the aisle in the words that came from the Lord Jesus Christ. The beginning of the creation of God, he referred to himself. Jesus was involved with creation. In various times, we've looked at verses in the Bible, whether they're from chapter 1 of the Gospel of John or maybe the first chapter of the epistle of 1 John or the first chapter of the book of Colossians. We learn from Scripture that Jesus was involved in creation that all things were made for him and through him. Well, he said, I know your works. What we discover in this particular letter is that there are no words of commendation. 
no good things that are said about this particular church and the people in it. It's only words of condemnation and warning. He said, I know your works. And that means in this context that they were not good works. Remember that the very first letter that we read, the church of uh, to the church of Ephesus, the works that they had were good works. And they had great discernment. Their problem was they got so involved with doing good works and doing things that they left their first love, that special relationship and fellowship that they had on a daily basis with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I said, you may recall, I fear that our churches in our day, the ones that aren't like this particular church in Laodicea, have a tendency to be like that one in Ephesus in that we get so involved in doing things, and they're good things, but we get so involved in that that we fail to keep our first love, spending precious and special time in reading God's word and in prayer and fellowshipping with him. So he says, I know your works. They were all bad works. They were lukewarm works. The people of Laodicea could relate to this analogy of lukewarmness because in the place where they lived, they could look across a valley and see upon a mountain, snow-capped mountains, and they put a, uh, we would call it a pipeline, aqueduct of some sort, that brought the cold water from melted snow from the mountaintops to Laodicea. But by the time that it got there, it was no longer cold. It was lukewarm. In addition, in the valley, they could see a place where there were hot springs and even steam coming up from them. And again, they brought water from those hot springs to the city of Laodicea. And it also was lukewarm by the time that it got there. So when Jesus used this analogy that they were neither cold nor hot, but they were lukewarm, they could relate to how unpleasant water that was lukewarm was when compared to either cold water or hot water. He compared their works and their undesirable works to the undesirable lukewarm water. We get the idea from this letter that they were rich materially, but they were spiritually bankrupt. They were unaware that they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The warnings that he gave, the rebukes that he gave, he chastened those whom he loves, he said, but they were about to be spewed out of his mouth. And then he told them to repent and open the door that he might come in. This is that place where we have often referred to as Jesus standing before a door that has no handle on the outside. It has to be opened from the inside. Jesus is wanting and willing to have a relationship with every person on earth. But he doesn't force himself upon them. It's as if he stands at the door and knocks, like what he says in this particular passage. And it's up to the person on the inside to open the door. That's where we find this coming together of the strain between God's sovereignty and election and man's free will. God would choose that and desire that everyone come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it has to be volitionally and a decision that's made by the individual to believe in Christ and to trust in him and to accept him and consider him to be their Lord and Savior. So the coming together of these two, man's free will and God's sovereignty, we see in this picture that we've sometimes seen as a painting of the Lord Jesus Christ standing before a door with no knob on the outside. He said, repent and open the door that he might come in. And then the promise to the overcomers that they would be able to sit with him on his throne just as he had overcome the world 
and was allowed to sit down at the right hand of his father at his father's throne. One of these days, the Lord will come back and sit upon his own throne. It will be that throne that he inherits from his father, David, from the city of Jerusalem in Israel, when he comes back and sets up his 1000 year earthly kingdom. Well, then we saw the very last of this passage, like the last of the four church letters at the end of this chapters two and three. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. We get the idea from the chronological and prophetical view of these churches. Remember that there are several different views of interpretation and application. First and foremost is that they were real, literal churches that were operating during the time of John writing this book of Revelation around 95 AD. They were real churches. They were in operation. And they had characteristic traits that Jesus referred to when he wrote these letters to each of them. And each of them got a copy of the other people's letters, just like you and I have a copy of all seven. And they were to learn not only from the letter that was individually written to them, but also from the letters that were written to the other churches. And we are encouraged to do the same. So the first view is that they were letters written to real literal churches. The second view is sometimes referred to as a composite view in that the churches represent various churches that we can find in every age by the characteristic traits and the things they experienced and the, the good things and the bad things that they had or experienced and the words of instruction or uh, commendation or condemnation, the warnings that were given. And then I also mentioned that I believe that it's oftentimes possible to find individuals within a church that represent all of these seven, seven characteristic traits of these churches. But as we've said several times, the most interesting and controversial view of interpretation is that this is history written in advance. The church age, the 2000 years plus since Jesus ascended back into heaven, that is the age of grace in which you and I live, that these letters in the order in which they're given to these churches represent the various periods of church history that the church has experienced and gone through between the first coming of Christ and when he comes back the second time to set up his kingdom. So as a review of these churches that make up this church age or the age of grace in which we live and the lessons that are to be learned by each one or from each one, from first, the church in Ephesus. Even if we have good doctrine and discernment and good works, we need to be careful that we don't leave our first love, that special intimate relationship that we have with Christ that results in us spending quality time with him. Many times it's referred to as a quiet time alone with God. <clears throat> From the second church, the church of Smyrna, the persecuted church. The lesson that we learn from that is don't fear persecution. What we have seen throughout the history of the church since Christ went back to heaven is that every place in the world where the church is persecuted, it thrives and it grows, even though it is most of the time in those situations underground. In our country, we've been blessed, certainly during the life time that you and I have been alive, that we've not had to deal with that type of persecution in our country. But the way the things are going right now, we can see the possibility that that type of persecution is coming our way. And the lesson we learned from the letter to the church in Smyrna is don't fear persecution. From the church in Pergamos, that compromising church that was married to the world, the lesson that we would learn is that the idolatry of the world and the new and sinful morality that comes from the world will assure that people will 
end up going into judgment and we're not to compromise with the world. Very similar, the lessons from the church letter to Thyatira. They had idolatry in their church and paganism began to creep in and to be added in with what we would, I guess, consider righteous ceremonial worship. And the rebuke or the warning that was given to them was that if they did not repent without doubt, they would go into persecution or into the time of tribulation. From the church of Sardis, that church that's referred to as the Reformation Church or sometimes the denominational church. And that particular one, the lesson comes from them in that the deadness was covered up by worldly success. And even though they had a name that they were alive, yet they were dead. That's a little bit similar to the problems that we find in the Laodicean church. And then from the sixth letter, the church to Philadelphia, that church that had no bad things said against it, only good things. And the instruction or the lesson that we can learn from that is that even if we're involved in doing good works and we're careful to, uh, to follow after God's word and to be a loving church and sending out missionaries and all that, the encouragement is for us to hold fast to what we have so that we don't lose a reward come judgment day. And that judgment day for believers is not the great white throne judgment, but it's the judgment seat of Christ where the decision at the judgment at the judgment seat of Christ is not to determine whether we get into heaven or not, but if we receive a reward or not. And then from this last letter, the seventh one to the church of Laodicea, they are the compromise or not the compromising, but the apostate church, the lukewarm church. Well, I think that we can see from this chronological or prophetical view of these letters and these periods of church history is that the Philadelphian church and the Laodicean church operate side by side in the world until that time when the Philadelphian church is raptured out of the world prior to Daniel's 70th week or the tribulation period where they were promised that they would be kept from or out of the hour of trial that would come upon all the earth. And then the Laodicean church will enter into the tribulation period. So I believe that we're living close to the end of our current age at the time of these last two churches, the Philadelphian church and the Laodicean church, the loving church and the apostate church. The great danger of our time is the apostasy of the world entering into the church taking us away from God and his word and the principles that he has given us to live by. And I might share some things that Dr. McGee put in his commentary on these letters to these churches and especially to this one from Laodicea. And in fact, it wasn't something that he came up with. It's something that he saw. He said that it's an inscription on the on the on the cathedral in Lübeck, Germany. And he said it's still there to this day. And so translating it into modern English, it goes as follows. Thus speaks Christ our Lord to us. You call me master and obey me not. You call me light and see me not. You call me way and walk me not. You call me life and choose me not. You call me wise and follow me not. You call me fair and love me not. You call me rich and ask me not. You call me eternal and seek me not. You call me noble and serve me not. You call me gracious and trust me not. You call me might and honor me not. You call me just and fear me not. If I condemn you, condemn you, blame me not. Well, 
It's kind of a sad commentary on the letter to the church of Laodicea, the apostate church, the church that will be present during the time of the tribulation period. I have told the people in our church family for several years, even before I became the pastor four years ago, that I think that we're living in a time that unless the Lord returns, we'll live through a period in our country where we will see the true believers driven back into the church or back into the, the home, underground, so to speak, and the apostate church that goes along with the apostasy of the world will be the ones that still meet in the public buildings in the middle of towns or the outskirts of downtown. And that the true church will be cleansed and purged from nominal Christianity and will be driven back into the homes in private so that we might be able to worship the Lord according to the word of God without persecution. I hope that I'm wrong, but I think that I see that coming. And this is a bad commentary as we come to the end of these seven letters. As we said several weeks ago, the late Dr. Chuck Missler said that chapters two and three of the book of Revelation are the most relevant chapters in the whole book for you and me in the time in which we live. Because they speak about the church age in which we live and they give instructions to correct things that are wrong and to give encouragement to maintain things that are good. And so they're very meaningful to us and it would be probably good for us to read them every so often and to consider the lessons that we find in them. Next week, we'll begin to look at the throne room of heaven when we move into that third section of the book of Revelation, the prophetical section, the future section. Remember that in verse 19 of chapter one, there is the uh, example given, the uh, outline given of the book of Revelation, past, present, and future. Chapter one represents the past, the things that John had seen. Chapters two and three represent the present, the church that now is. And we are in the, I believe, close to the end of that present period. And when we get to chapter four, we step into the future period when John is invited up into heaven and he begins to give us in the best attempt that he can the description of what he sees when he's allowed into the very throne room of heaven. And so from that point forward, everything that we see in the book is yet in the future, even from the day in which we live. So we'll be in chapters four and five next week. I doubt that we get to chapter five, but we'll certainly enter into chapter four next week. I hope that you are enjoying our study through the book of Revelation. I hope that you've had a, a good 2022 in spite of the way the world's going. I pray that we all have a spiritually profitable 2023 until the Lord comes. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, for the promise of eternal life that you've given us because of his shed blood for us on the cross. Help us that as this new year comes in, that we would be even more determined to live and to be faithful to you. Thank you so much for those who join us online. I pray for your blessings upon them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I guess we'll see you next, next year. Hope that you have a great Lord's Day tomorrow, a safe and enjoyable New Year's Eve tonight, and we look forward to seeing you next week and next year. Until then, Lord bless you.